Welcome back to the 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. My name is Wayne Kimmel, managing partner of 76 Capital, the sports tech venture capital company. And on this show, I interview top sports entrepreneurs, athletes, and executives who are truly shaping and many times changing the sports business industry. Today, we're going to talk all about the exciting things that are happening within the world of college sports and women's sports with Emily Karen, the sports business reporter for Sportico. Emily, welcome to the 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Well, I'm really excited to have you on the show. Uh, you know, several episodes back, I was had the uh, opportunity of bringing on uh, Scott and Evan, which was a lot of fun, had the two of them together. Uh, what is it like working for uh, and working with Scott and Evan at, at Sportico? It's funny. I um, I listened to, to the show where you had them on, and that's kind of a, just a glimpse into everyday life with them. They really are frickin' frack. It's like... <laughs> two halves of uh, one brain there, but um, no, it's great. Scott is a, is a great boss and he really uh, is passionate about what we're building at Sportico. And Evan and I actually work together, um, a, you know, on a day-to-day basis doing a lot of our college coverage. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a good time. Well, let's jump into that. I mean, from a college perspective, so much is happening across the sports industry and specifically in colleges and, and the whole college landscape has has truly changed just over the last couple of years. What are some of the exciting things that, that you're covering and you're keeping an eye on today? Yeah, I think, you know, the business of college sports is interesting. It's um it's it's quite the task to keep a pulse on because you have so many institutions and so many different sort of um budgets and financial situations and conferences and whatnot. But um, I think what we've seen most recently on that, you know, is going to have the biggest impact on all of that. It's just these conversations about realignment. Obviously started with Texas and Oklahoma kind of dropping uh, the news that they were departing for the SEC in this sort of looming super conference. Um, And then I think we're also still just keeping a pulse on sort of the fallout from COVID. how that impacted athletic department budgets, who's still recovering, where kind of extra loans and debt came out um, and sort of what the path forward looks like from there. And then obviously um, NIL and sort of the NCAA's role in governance is probably, those are probably the last two big storylines as of late. Um, NIL, I'm sure most folks listening to this are familiar with, um, you know, athletes now have this newfound opportunity to monetize their name, image, and likeness, um, which we've seen a lot of them start to take advantage of. And then the fallout from that uh, has been, you know, the NCAA sort of taking a step back, um, taking a less uh, hands-on approach and figuring out sort of where it fits in the future of college athletics governance. So uh, no shortage of of, uh, stories for us. Well, it's certainly, it's amazing. And and you and, and, and the team at Sportico have really been one of the major sources of information across what's happening within the within the college sports industry today, and then you have you know some of the the big players like the Learfields of the world that had really dominated the the college landscape, and then you have up and comers, and I wouldn't even have to. Well, I'm not sure if you can even call them an up and comer anymore anymore, but companies like Playfly, led by Mike Schreiber and what he's doing, um, it must be exciting to sort of see the what's happening with those companies as well as in, in the overall you know, business of, of college sports today? Yeah, I think college sports were uniquely stagnant. Uh, maybe that's the way to say it for a long time because there wasn't necessarily a need to innovate. You know, people were going to tune in to watch Alabama football, no matter what the broadcast looked like, whether or not sports betting was integrated, whether or not, you know, players were mic'd up, they were going to watch. And so, there wasn't necessarily a need to sort of reevaluate um, or even innovate when it came to sponsorships and partnerships and broadcast um, and even distribution strategy. Um, and we've seen, you know, some conferences start to try and bring some of the media in house. They're partnering with networks to launch their own um, sort of broadcast network. They dabbling in streaming and whatnot. Um, but we really didn't see a whole ton of innovation. And I think the last five years in particular, and then, you know, throughout COVID, we've really started to see that ramp up in a way that it didn't before. And like you mentioned, you know, newcomers in the space like Playfly are sort of reevaluating how 
sponsorships and multimedia rights deals work and the role that they can play in all of that. Um, and the incumbents like Learfield are then having to sort of um, re reflect on their own position as a result. Um, so it's been exciting to watch. Well, going back to one of the points you made earlier about NIL, I mean, this whole name, image, and likeness situation, I guess, or, or opportunity um, has really been fascinating. And it's something that the was, was coming down the pike. NCAA, in a way, was kind of like, will it, you know, they kind of just didn't really make a decision on it. And next thing you know, it's live and you know, college athletes were able to go out and, and do deals. And how, how have you seen that work out so far? NIL is, uh, is definitely an interesting sort of case study in like a new opportunity uh, in a market because you essentially had three or four bigger players kind of dabbling in the space before we actually had any NIL um, rule changes and before it was actually allowed, right? You had folks who had worked with athletic departments on the social media side before who had worked on the content side, sort of preparing for this new NIL era, as they call it. Um, and then the market sort of actually came, became live and became a real opportunity. And you saw like 15 other players try to jump in into the pool. Um, and then the last year, I think we've seen those companies try to kind of sort themselves out and figure out what they want to offer, what the best way to go about, you know, providing NIL services is. And you've seen almost all of them shift their approach or add on to their approach because the market is just evolving so quickly. And it's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's incredibly fragmented now. You have, you know, Open Doors and Influencer and you have all these big names at the top, but then you also have all of those companies launching individual marketplaces at individual schools, and then you have collectives. So you have kind of everybody just trying to grab a piece of, of NIL. Um, and I think we'll see some of that start to settle over the next couple months. Um, I think you'll see some companies not find enough traction to kind of keep going. Maybe they're not doing it, you know, there's not enough volume of deals coming through their platform for it to be worth it for them to consider pursuing it. Um, but right now we kind of have everyone who wants to be an NIL is in NIL <laughs> trying to make it work. Um, so we'll see how that goes. And, but I imagine the next, you know, several months in particular, we'll see some of those players start to bow out and some sort of kind of elevate their status. At the well, same time. Has there been any specific NIL deal that has really caught your eye or caught your attention over the last year or so? I think what we're seeing mostly actually is, um, you know, really hyper local deals. And I think that's what a lot of folks expected, you know, before when this was all still hypothetical um, was just the fact that, you know, a, a college athlete, there are very few college athletes that have sort of a national name recognition or a national sort of staying power. Um, but there are many college athletes who are very recognizable at the local level and are very useful ambassadors or kind of tools of activation in that sense. Um, so I think we've, you know, those are probably the ones that I've seen find the most success. Um, and then you do have, you know, you have bigger companies who are starting to dabble in the space. Um, but I think one of the cooler parts just on a human side of NIL that we've seen is, you know, like an athlete, uh, one of the linebackers on West Virginia's football team, like he likes to play um, his guitar and he likes to go sing at bars and he couldn't use his own name and likeness to do that before. And now he's just marketing, you know, the heck out of himself and people who like West Virginia football are going to go watch him play on a Saturday night in the off season now. And, you know, throw a 20 in his, in his uh, guitar case. And it's just cool to see how athletes have kind of taken this um, off the field, if you will. And I think there have been some cool um, opportunities there. Well, we've certainly seen it. One of our portfolio companies at 76 Capital, Diamond Kinetics, has been working with some some incredible softball players um, in across the um, NCAA, and and that's something that we weren't able to do in the past. Um, and we've worked with a number of the of the top um, softball programs, and you know, use they've you've been using all of the technology and, and the different you know sensor you know sensors inside of the balls and bats and things like that. But we weren't really able to do much more than just put the logo of the university. But now we can have some of the top pitchers and hitters and that's something that has been really um been great for us to see. And and I wonder if you've if you've seen any other companies that have been able to to um 
kind of integrate themselves into the into the world of, of, of collegiate sports so far? Yeah, we've seen, um, you know, a, a few that are sort of, like I said, more local that have tried to do this. Um, you've seen a lot of um, sort of smaller apparel companies try to do this, right? I think, you know, there's an athleisure line, Viore, who just basically started giving, you know, 25% off codes to a bunch of athletes said that they could count that as, you know, the, the NIL deal and they would post in exchange for it. You know, and that's a company who is trying to compete with big names like Lululemon. And they're now, you know, finding, you know, athletes who actually will wear their products um, very easily and perhaps cater to an audience where, you know, Viore is at a better price point for them than Lululemon. You know, if you're a college kid, I don't know that you're dropping $100 on leggings uh, very often. But we've seen a lot of brands like that sort of use, you um, just really, I guess, you know, tailor their audience based on the, the athletes that they now have access to. And I think it's been relatively effective thus far. Um, tech companies are interesting. Um, you know, there, I think there's tremendous opportunity for tech companies to get increasingly involved and use athletes as sort of like a, a testing ground, if you will, right? There are so many college athletes you could have test out, you know, your training products or, you know, your new feedback technology and that kind of stuff. And I imagine we'll start to see more of that. Um, I think there was probably just a hesitancy uh, at the start to really get involved when everyone was still figuring out the rules. Um, but we have seen, you know, Facebook uh, meta is now getting involved and they're starting to use athletes. Um, they've used Sedona Prince at Oregon as one of the testers of like a new Instagram monetization tool called subscription. So there's a little bit of dabbling there, but um We'll see how how much traction that industry gets. Yeah, I mean, and you know, one of the things that you know, you you certainly are, you know, you, you cover the, the college side, and we also on the women's side of sports today. And I noticed on your on your Twitter Twitter account, you have the you know kind of pinned at the top. You have a, a story that you wrote about Trinity Rodman. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, women's sports are at a really, um, I think, interesting inflection point from a sports business perspective. I think we have seen over the last two years in particular a ton of momentum sort of get behind women's sports. And now I think a lot of leagues are trying to capitalize on that from a business perspective, right? You're seeing um, an influx of investor money, of sponsor money, of, of additional media dollars and that kind of stuff. Um, and you're also seeing sort of the structure of the leagues change as a result. So the NWSL has a new CBA, its first ever CBA, um, which, you know, increased salaries and whatnot, but it also ended up um, basically providing what's called allocation money, which they had before, but it's now more formalized, which is sort of additional money that teams can, can purchase, quote unquote, um, to pay, whether that's, you know, to pay a few players a little bit more than the, the maximum salary or what the Washington Spirit did was actually pay Trinity Rodman significantly more. Um, she is, you know, 19 years old, now the highest paid player in NWSL history, you know, topping the likes of Alex Morgan and uh, Megan Rapino. And I think that the club was really just trying to signal a commitment to their players and to growth. Um, you know, the, the Spirit in particular had a pretty rocky off season. <laughs> there was a lot, of, a lot of headlines about their front office that probably weren't super favorable. Um, a lot of questions sort of about the stability of leadership in the team. And I think this was an opportunity that they saw to, to send out a message about what they want to be moving forward. You know, one of the things that I think that Sportico has really stood out um, in, its, in its short lifespan, I guess, so far, um, has been breaking some top stories. Um, it seems like you and, and a number of the uh, members of the, of, of the team at, at Sportico have become you know, some of the people that are breaking some of the in incredible stories. And I know that's an important part of being a, a sports journalist and just a journalist in general. So how do you do that? How are you able to go out there and, and find these, these, these stories before anyone else knows? Well, first I will say that I'm, if Sasha Nick is listening to this, I'm sure he's flattered to hear you say that. Um, I know, you know, breaking news has been one of the, the primary tenants that we've tried to build Sportico on. Um, and Scott has been, you know, preaching the importance of that to all of us since so even before day one, uh, since, you know, some of us came on, I was one of sort of the original uh, reporters that we brought on staff even before we launched. Um, so, that was kind of, you know, the charge from, from pre-launch on. Um, and I think it really just comes down to building relationships. I think it comes down to 
being well connected and well sourced in your beats, but also, you know, being connected to folks who trust you to handle, you know, the information that, that they're passing along to you um, with, you know, the, the journalistic integrity that we hopefully are, are known for at Sportico. Um, and just to, to do it justice and not, not that that means to, you know, only write favorable coverage, but just to always be fair and sort of even keeled in the way we approach things and to be thorough and making sure that we have, you know, the appropriate um, and adequate context around all the news. Um, and I think we have made it, you know, uh, we've made it known to our sources and, and leagues and the folks that we work with that we are interested in breaking news and that's the business we're in. Um, and it's just, you know, slowly day by day chipping away at doing a little more of that. So how does that work in kind of in, I guess we're, as we're now, you know, fortunately in a, in a world where we can now start to move around more freely. Um, you mentioned to me earlier, you'll be at South by Southwest. That's a big, big thing for, for Sportico. Uh, it's exciting all the, you know, in-person events that are now happening. But over the last couple of years, when Sportico started in the middle of a pandemic and you were not able to go around and do what, what reporters were doing, how did you do that during that time? Yeah, developing sources through a computer screen is very difficult, <laughs> I will say. Um, it is not quite uh, the same as what I think most reporters were used to. That said, it's not impossible. And I think because everyone was in the same boat, um, you know, I think it, it, start, it starts with just, you know, covering news stories as they come um, and making sure that you're, you're getting on those leagues and teams' radars that you're interested in the news that they have to share. Um, and then hopefully in time being able to, you know, get some time one-on-one -on -one to chat with folks, um, you know, even just a phone call here and there to check in on how they're doing. Um, I'm a big believer that, you know, the best way to develop a relationship with the source is not just to call them when you need something from them. Um, you know, whether that's, you know, wishing them happy holidays, just checking in if you haven't heard from them in a while, seeing how things are going on their end. Um, it's just a, it's a slow build. And I think, you know, developing relationships is, not necessarily a skill that can be taught. It's definitely not something I learned when I was studying journalism in school. You know, they, they tell you about the importance of it, but it's hard to actually uh, actually get some experience doing that until you're in the role. I think I was fortunate in that I had covered, um, you know, the business of college sports in particular, and I had covered women's sports um, at, at previous stops in my career. And so there were some sources that I sort of already had worked with or who I was vaguely familiar with, and they were vaguely familiar with me. Um, and th those were kind of the places that I started. But, you know, hopefully as we continue to turn a corner and, and more in-person events continue, um, that becomes even easier. And we have to do less, uh, you know, Zoom calls and I can do more, you know, coffee meetings. Absolutely. No, we, we're all we're all excited for, for all of that to to be fully back. Um, has, has there been a story so far that you've that you've covered or a person that you've covered that you just really enjoyed or were just in, wasn't really intrigued by? Ooh, that's a tough question. Um, I would say yes at different points in my career. I think the first big story I ever did was actually as an intern at ESPN. And I wrote about um, the kicker, the Penn State kicker at the time, then Joey Julius. And I think I was just you know, it was a very personal story about some, um, you know, mental health struggles he'd been going through and how, you know, the, the kind of culture of a college football program clashed with a lot of that. Um, and I think it was just a very personal story to tell. And I think I felt sort of the responsibility of making sure I, I did, um, you know, I gave that the respect that it was due. Um, and I just really also enjoyed sort of the humanity of that, I think, especially now in, in, sports that we are talking so much about money and about, you know, contracts and salaries and team sales and all that stuff. Some of that gets lost. Um, I love doing that. And I also, you know, I recently wrote during the Olympics, a story about Hillary Knight, um, you know, who plays for the women's national hockey team. And I think just tracking her journey and, and the, um, the progression as a, a female athlete who, you know, came of age, so to speak, uh, when social media was just starting and sort of the parallel trajectory of her career and the growth of social media, that sounds really nerdy of me, but that um, was a really fun story to tell too. And I also, I have found, um, you know, female athletes can be particularly candid in a way that you don't often get from, you know, a big name NBA star now, because I think there's an awareness of their need to participate in, you know, building their brand and the, and the brand of their leagues that maybe, 
you know, an NBA player doesn't feel the same responsibility or burden. Um, so that's, um, I always enjoyed those conversations. Was this a career that you knew you wanted to get into when you were younger? Or was this something that you kind of, while in college, you decided that you want to do this? Or was, was this, was, or was there someone in your life that, you know, has, you're kind of like, wow, I want to be like, like him or her someday. So have you ever had the, is that something that you, you think about or, or have? Uh, that's a great question. I think, um, so I am the oldest of four girls. My dad always wanted a boy, never got one. Um, and so I think by default of being the oldest and being, you know, the most mobile, he was a big sports guy. Um, and I grew up outside of DC. So anytime there was a game happening, you know, and he needed someone to tag along, I think I was the default. Um, and I, I really loved it. We would, you know, go up to Baltimore all the time because this was before, you know, the Nats came to DC and we'd go see O's games at Camden Yards. And so I was always a fan um, of, of sports and I really enjoyed, you know, that as a, you know, a pastime, right. Whether it was going to baseball games, going to hockey games, you know, even we would go to Wizards games. I haven't been to a Wizards game in years because they are not nearly as fun <laughs> as they used to be. Um, but, you know, that was way back in like the Gilbert Arenas era. And um, I was always a fan and I got to college and I knew I wanted to write. And I, I thought the journalism was the path I wanted to take. And then I went to the student paper and I told them I wanted to get involved. And they were like, great, we have an opening on the sports staff and we need someone who can just pick up the slack when everyone else is busy with you know, uh, tests or needs to study or, get, you know, class and whatnot. And they have conflicts with whatever their beats are. And I was like, sure, sounds good. I'm in. So I kind of just um, fell into it uh, in that sense. I mean, I knew journalism was the path. I didn't exactly know what I wanted to cover. Um, and then it sort of just uh, worked out. That's amazing. I mean, so uh, so your, your dad must be thrilled with what you're doing today. <laughs> yeah, he gets a he gets a kick out of it. So. Do you give him, you get him some press press passes or certain, you know, little presents? <laughs> I wish. Uh, I did get him some, uh, one of my colleagues when I was at Sports Illustrated was like going down to the Masters and I had him pick up a bunch of like Masters, you know, uh, golf towels and a hat and whatnot. And I, that was a nice Father's Day present uh, a few years back. So we've gotten to do a few little things like that, but. Oh, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. I'm sure he's, he's incredibly proud of, of what you're doing and, you know, you think about what's when what's happening today. You talked about earlier what's happening within the, the collegiate ranks and with women's sports, but across all sports, the the just the use of technology today, whether it's just new sensors or data analytics, NFTs, crypto, blockchain, the metaverse. I mean, all this stuff coming to the world of sports, it, it, it must make it even more exciting, complicated, um, you know, to, to write about and, and to really, you know, track everything that's happening across the world of sports today because of all this new technology. I think the cool thing about sports business in particular is that we're taking a look at that intersection much more than perhaps someone who is, you know, sort of in a more traditional sports journalism role where you're you know, covering games or covering specific events or teams. Um, so we've been able to keep a pretty close close eye on that. And I think, um, you know, Eben and I, this is not a shame, not a plug at all, but Eben and I host a, a Twitter spaces every Friday. And one of the topics that has come up pretty regularly actually is sort of the future of um, fandom and where technology plays a role in that and how it's going to change the future of fandom and how it even has changed the future of, or how it's changed sort of the fan experience over the course of our lifetimes already and how that will only continue to happen, right? You think about things like blockchain and conversations, you know, that the NBA is already having around ticketing and how that will start to, you know, integrate. You look at Dapper Labs and NFTs and how trading cards are, you know, all, you know, trading cards on one hand are becoming increasingly popular again when you're talking about, you know, as sort of a novelty or an, <clears throat> an artifact, so to speak, but then you're also looking at them being converted into NFTs and, and other digital assets and digital collectibles. Um, so I think it's a really interesting time to be in the industry. And I think especially to be in our business uh, where you're kind of trying to keep a pulse on all of these things. Um, and even just looking at, you know, the metaverse, I think in particular is a concept that I am definitely not an expert in. Um, but we, you know, we have one of our colleagues, Jacob Feldman covers tech and this sort of stuff for us. And he's done a really good job of just keeping a pulse on, 
you know, what leagues are experimenting with that and virtual reality and how soon we're going to actually start to see some, to see some of these things um, become part of the fan experience and become part of, you know, regular sports consumption. And I think it's probably going to be a lot sooner than we expected. Uh, you know, you even look at what the Panthers did last year with the virtual reality Carolina Panther that was like jumping all over um, the field and in the stadium. And like that, it was just wild to watch as a fan. Um, but, it, you know, I think we'll start to see even more of that. So it's a, uh, it's something we're definitely trying to keep an eye on. And there are obviously a lot of, you know, team owners and investors in sports leagues who are particularly passionate about a lot of this stuff um, and are excited to integrate it and implement it in, you know, their particular infrastructure. So I'm sure we will only continue to cover it even more. We certainly hope so with, with, with all the many of our investments across all those areas and some of the oh, I'm sure. <laughs> that are now happening, as you said, and all with augmented reality and NFTs and the metaverse. I mean, it's just something that there's, there's much, there's so much happening and, and it is okay to please, you know, plug with some of the things that you're doing. <laughs> it is great with what you and the team at, at Sportico are doing for the overall sports business um, industry. Uh, it's it's really great and important. And so those types of chats that you're doing, the fact that, you know, actually you talked about your Twitter, but we didn't give your Twitter handle. Why don't you give, give everyone your Twitter handle? Oh, um, I am at underscore EM Karen um, for anyone who is interested. Uh, a lot of women's sports stuff, a lot of college sports stuff, but also a lot of just regular sports stuff, because uh, given that, you know, we're only two years old, I feel like everyone is still a bit of a generalist at Sportico at the end of the day. <laughs> you know, it's all hands on deck, um, which is great. Well, it's really been been great seeing what what's happened at your at this this sports business startup, Sportico, over the last couple of years. Uh, it's great to see what, you, what you've been doing and, and the rest of the team. And it's been awesome having you on our show. And before we wrap up, I have to ask you, Emily, you know, you know you're, you're covering kind of what's next in, in the college space and on the women's side of things. What do you think potentially will be the, the really big story of 2022 that you're, that, that you know, maybe, maybe just a crazy prediction of what potentially could happen over the next year? Ooh, crazy prediction. Um, on the women's side, I think we could actually start to see a significant amount of media money flowing into women's sports. Um, I think that's probably, you know, you're seeing the sponsor dollars, you're seeing, you know, the, the investment. Um, and I think you'll probably start to now see the, the media money catch up to that. I think you look at how, you know, the conversations around the women's March Madness tournament have changed even the last year alone. Um, and now, you know, conversations about spinning that, that tournament off and selling it as sort of its own property and the, you know, the value that it could fetch there, which is probably tenfold what it's credited with as it's, you know, as part of this giant package now. Um, so I think we'll start to see, you know, media money start to flow there. And I think that sort of investment will make women's sports much more accessible. I think people will start to see them on TV more. People will start to interact with them more, um, which hopefully will be all part of a positive cycle. And on the college side, I think it's really just going to be, you know, what this new NCAA constitution looks like. You know, they, they wrote the constitution and now each division basically gets to overhaul its own rules. Um, so I think we'll see most of those um, set in stone, hopefully before the start of the football season. I think August 1st is when the constitution will go into effect, but I imagine divisions might need a little bit um, more time to figure out how the heck they're going to self-govern and what they want their future to look like. But a lot of change coming, that's for sure. And, and I got to follow up on that, on what you're just saying about the, you know, yeah, sure. how, how will that happen? Like, so the, the, the D1 schools, the bigger schools are going to write their own rules and then, or who's writing them and how's this all happening? <laughs> Yeah, it's a kind of a hot mess is basically how I would summarize it. Um, the new constitution in the NCAA, basically the rules are here's like a set, you know, guidelines, some overarching guidelines. And now all of you can go make your own rules. So each um, division, D1, D2 and D3 sort of created their own um, transformation committee is what a lot of them are calling them. Um, and it's, you know, presidents, chancellors, different ADs from within their institutions um, that are basically sitting down and rewriting the rules. I know several members of the D1 committee have, have publicly come out and said, like, the first conversation is, 
A, do we try to go through the existing bylaws, which are hundreds of pages of old NCAA rules, and, you know, with a fine-tooth comb and pick, you know, yes to this, no to this, okay, let's tweak this rule, or do we just start from scratch? Um, so I think a lot of them are still in that stage of just figuring out what the best approach is, and then I think this spring and summer will be a lot of the nitty-gritty of what does this actually look like, um, you know, and I think we'll also probably see some new rules written in there um, as it pertains perhaps to NIL, as it pertains to, you know, um, athlete unionization or the potential status as employees and all these other future conversations I imagine will be built in as sort of guardrails. Um, and then they all have to be approved at the end of this. So then they'll go through a whole, you know, draft, revision, approval process. So it'll probably be a, a while before any of this is official, official and or implemented, but they're, uh, they're starting on the long road to there. Well, it's certainly going to be an exciting 2022. There's going to be amazing things coming down the pike in the collegiate ranks and across women's sports. And we, we're all going to keep an eye on, on all the columns and, and stories that you're going to write over at Sportico. So, Emily, thank you so much for joining us on our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. you got to follow Emily. And again, it's underscore E.M. Karen. Uh, at on Twitter and to see all the things that, that Emily um, posts on. And um, again, thank you so much for joining our show. Of course, thanks for having me, this was fun. Well, another great edition of our 76 Capital Sports Leadership Show. Thanks to everyone for tuning in and go out there and go make it happen.